Thank you, Pat, and thank you all who came in from this beautiful sunny weather, which I'm not sure that I would have, but um, I'm glad that you did. And so as Pat said that I, um, I work on HIV vaccines, and I also have a, a really a long, you know, probably a, a lifelong interest in communicating science for the public, which for many years I didn't actually know was a thing. And of late have come to learn that, you know, vis-a-vis uh, -vis my moth story. So the talk today that I'm going to tell you about is Dendritic Cells, HIV Vaccines, the Nobel Prize, an Amazing Adventure. So I'm going to tell you more about my life and my career than I might usually in a general scientific talk. But I think for a, a group of young, presumably budding scientists and perhaps journalists, it's very important to understand that at the end, any career path looks pretty straightforward because you got from A to B. But how you got there you know, may involve many, many zigs and zags. And so I'm not even going to tell you about all my zigs and zags, but just a few. So I'm going to start long before I was even born with a picture of my grandmother. And this is my grandmother, who was a member of the Bellevue internship class of 1921. She was one of the first two women interns at Bellevue which is um, the city hospital in New York City still. She graduated from Tufts Medical School um, in 1919, 19, I guess 1920, and she was one of four medical students there. This, this woman is Patricia White, who was her um, co-female -inter, co intern who ended up being a very prominent diabetologist at Boston Children's. I, am, I don't usually have this slide, but I included it. And I am wearing today my grandmother's bracelet. And I'm sure many of you have heirloom jewelry that you treasure. And I have some that has you know, some value, like my grandmother's engagement ring. But this bracelet, oh, which I have, oh, now I've managed to get myself, which I've actually stopped wearing every day because I was wearing it out. Can you see what it is? Microscopes, exactly. And this is my grandmother's monogram, not mine. My father's family spent summers on Cape Cod, and there was a silversmith by the name of Panis. And I mentioned his name because I once mentioned it, and somebody came up to me and said that they knew his family. Um, and typically, this bracelet would have had seashells or a flower or some sort of other pretty ornament. But my uncle and my father had this made for my grandmother on the occasion of her 50th birthday. And when I got into medical school, she gave it to me. And I'm actually a pathologist by training, so microscopes have a particular meaning to me. But, um, and, and as I said, I used to wear it all the time, but then it started to wear out, so now I save it for special occasions. But I am wearing it. So afterward, if anybody wants to see it, I will be happy to give you a viewing in the flesh. Um, I as Pat said, I come from the Rockefeller, where it is not quite this cold and snowy, but it felt about this cold and snowy on Monday. It, it's a remarkable institution. It was founded as the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research um, and became the Rockefeller University in the early 60s. It's located, for those of you who, who know New York, there aren't too many farms in New York. It's located on what was the last farm on the island of Manhattan. And it was uh, basically commissioned by John D. Rockefeller when it became clear to him that um, science in, in Europe had, had reached a point, biological sciences, where it could inform the practice of medicine. So before that, before 1901, science and medicine were really two separate endeavors. Medicine was really an art, if that, and science you know, was, was a nascent field known as natural philosophy. So um, it was started in the image of the Institut Pasteur, the Koch Institute, and these other great institutes of, of, of uh, biological research that were being founded in Europe. It became, as I said, the Rockefeller University in 1965 when we began accepting graduate students. It's a tiny place. We have 70 labs. I think we have 300 students. They're all getting PhDs. Um, and it's a wonderful place to do research. This is me in 1979, long before most of you were born. I came to the Rockefeller, and I'm, this is why I'm telling you this about my life. I, I was a high school student who loved biology, and the Rockefeller then had a series of lectures called the Christmas Lectures, 
now called um, the holiday lectures, that were made in the image of um, demonstrations that had been done in London f to interest young, young people in science. The notion being if you got people early, you got them for good. It worked for me, and I was invited to this lecture. A biology teacher gave me a ticket. Now, of course, you sign up online. And I came home, and I said, my parents, my dad was a lawyer, my mom is a physical therapist. They'd never heard of the place. And I said, you know, I said, this was this amazing place, and I really wanted to get a summer job there. And they sort of said, okay, fine. And then, remember, this is the day after Christmas. On New Year's Day, my mother went to a holiday party there where she met somebody, and they were chatting. And this woman said her friend, husband, had the worst working hours of anybody she knew. He was a doctor, but he didn't even see patients and he was at the Rockefeller University. So with nerve that I wouldn't have at this point in my life, I said, can you get me his phone number? I'll call him and see if he'll hire me. So my mother got his phone number for me and I called him and he um, interviewed me on the phone and he was frugal then as he remained his whole life and he said, well, you can volunteer in the lab but we don't have money to pay you. We'll reimburse you for your commutation ticket and we will pay, give you meal tickets for the cafeteria. And what he didn't know was I would have paid him, but <laughs> um, that man turned out to be Ralph Steinman. So I started working for him in 1977. That the, this 1979 me, I, I had one in 78 and I had one in 77, but I don't know where they are. But again, just in terms of how much things have changed, I had to scrub out my social security number, which was uh, my ID number. So this is a photograph of our lab from 1980 and 81. And for those of you who can't recognize me right away, there I am, and there's Ralph. This is a photograph of Ralph and his mentor, Dr. Zan Cohen, who no doubt would have shared the Nobel Prize with him had, had he lived, but he died in 1993. So Ralph went to the Rockefeller in 1971 with the question, to address the question of how immunity was in, initiated how the immune response got started. People had begin to under, begun to understand T cells and B cells, but how the whole thing started was a bit of a mystery, or not just a bit of a mystery. And that was really the question that interested him. And in his, at the time, it was thought that macrophages were the primary antigen-presenting cell. And for those of you who are not um, cellular physiology aficionados, macrophages are the scavenger cells of the body, and they have lysosomes which are sort of suicide granules, which have enzymes and dissolve a lot of things. And those granules also serve as site for many parasites and bacteria, including tuberculosis. So he, Ralph was looking at cultures of macrophages, and they're made by adhering cells to glass because the fact that they, they phagocytize allows them to actually stick really hard to glass. And in those cultures, he saw cells that look different. I'm really having trouble with this. I'm not good with these things. And he saw that they had these tree-like projections, and he named them dendritic cells for dendrion. The original description of these cells from which this photo photograph is a picture appeared in the Journal of Experimental Medicine actually in three papers in 1973 and 74. And they're actually beautiful papers, and I would recommend, if you're interested, that you might consider reading them even now. He was um, awarded the Nobel Prize for this discovery in 2011. This is my husband and I. We had the great honor of accompanying his wife, Claudia, to the ceremonies in Stockholm. This is the Nobel concert. Um, 2011, Physiology or Medicine for his discovery of the dendritic cell and its role in adaptive immunity. As many of you may know, um, sadly, Ralph died of pancreatic cancer three days before that prize was awarded. So he did not actually get to receive the prize, nor did he know he won the prize. So it's sort of one of these great ironies of life. And, um, but with that, the prize um, guaranteed sort of the, his legacy, and it really um, confirmed the importance of dendritic cells, I think, in everybody's mind. It's just a shame, oh, the bell is lovely. It's just a shame it didn't come a little bit sooner. The whole, that whole story is actually the subject of my moth piece. So if you're interested, you can find that online. It's just coincidence that it, it happens to be this week. So to get to the sort of meat of the matter, 
so the immune system is characterized, um, it, it is in a very important part of the body, and it does several things. It's responsible for immunity, for vaccine protection, cancer therapy, autoimmunity, which is an immune response to your own, one's own body. And the, 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 the medical implications of that are for lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 diabetes. And then, of course, as Pat mentioned, allergy. One encounters allergens all the time, both um, food allergies from eating food and inhaled allergies like asthma and the pollen allergies that are no doubt bothering many of you today. So the essential elements of immunity are antigens, which are any substance, either foreign or self, that's recognized by the immune system. So that can be a microorganism, a virus, bacteria, or parasite. It can be pollen, it can be a vaccine, and most commonly, it's one's own cells. Remember, our, our cells are being uh, repopulated all the time. So as cells die, our bodies are making immune responses to them, and perhaps more importantly, our bodies are not making immune responses to them. And dendritic cells are orchestrating that delicate balance. Antibodies are proteins in the blood that are made by the B cell lymphocytes. This is also known as the humoral arm of the immune system, hearkening back to Hippocrates and the four humors. But these are, these are um, transferable. Cellular immunity is the response of the cells of the immune system that directly respond to antigen and often require direct contact from the cell as opposed to antibodies which work at a distance. So I always like to say there are three things I'd like you to remember from any talk. Somebody once told me you really, it's really hard to remember more than three things. So the properties of the immune response are specificity. So you make an immune response to oak pollen and not pine pollen. Diversity, and perhaps most important, memory. So when you encounter um, an illness, if you encounter, say, measles, which I guess probably none of you have had anymore. There are some old people in the audience like me who are old enough to remember childhood diseases. But once you got measles as a kid, you never got it again. And that's because of memory. So as I said, the B cell lymphocytes, the, the, the cells that make up the immune system, the B cell lymphocytes are the antibody producing cells. And people often think that B stands for bone marrow. It in fact stands for the word bursa, which is the organ in birds in their cloaca where these cells were first identified, their bursal origin, and they produce immunoglobulin in response to antigen. This is an antibody. An immunoglobulin produced by B cells may be neutralizing, as in specifically kills a virus, bacteria, or parasite, or simply binding or non-neutralizing. And it's turning out that non-neutralizing antibodies are perhaps more important than anybody thought. That's a very um, hot topic of investigation right now. But what I'd like you to remember from this slide is the shape. So antibodies have a Y shape, and this is the specific end, or the FAB, the, the, the end that binds to the antigen. And then this is what's called the constant region, or the FC region. For many years, the FC region was thought to be sort of null and just a carrier. It turns out that's anything but true. And a colleague of mine by the name of Jeff Ravitch has defined both activating and silencing um, variants in the FC region. So depending on the mutations in the FC region, you can have an antibody that stimulates a response or one that quiets one down. And that's yet another mechanism for this delicate balance that the immune system orchestrates. T lymphocytes, T cell lymphocytes, are the effector cells of thymic origin. And the thymus is an immune organ that lies directly over the heart in mammals. It's large in children. It's the largest absolute size of the human thymus is the age of two. And after two, it's all downhill. It involutes and gets smaller. And in adults, it's really just a remnant. But it, that is the site of, of education of the T cells. And there are two broad types of T cell lymphocytes, CD4 T cells, which help and CD8 cells, which are the killer cells, and they kill by direct contact. They're both critical in antiviral and anti-tumor immunity. So dendritic cells, which are you know, the sort of love of my life, are antigen-presenting cells that pick up and process all of the antigens and present them into, to both T and B cells in a way that they can be seen or in a cognate way. And a, a 
friend, colleague of mine by the name of Jacques Banchereau likes to refer to it as the menage a trois. So dendritic cells, when Ralph first identified them, were thought to be only present in immune organs. He identified them first in the spleens of mice, and it was a big deal when they were identified in people. And over the years, as I presented these lectures, you know, at first we said they were in the immune organs, then we said they were everywhere but the heart and the brain, then they were everywhere but the brain, and now it just turns out they're everywhere. So it's sort of simpler. But they are concentrated in the skin and mucosal surfaces where they survey the external environment for antigens, and then in the lymph nodes where they orchestrate the response. And the tonsils and adenoids make up mucosally associated lymphoid tissue. But they're pretty much everywhere. But they're in very small numbers. And that's part of the reason they were hard for others to see. They like to die, they're post-mitotic, and they're quite fragile, and they um, are very potent, so you only need very few of them. So this is a slide that Ralph loved to show, the elegance and scope of immunology, the cells of the immune orchestra. So in the beginning, it was just thought that there was a single kind of dendritic cell, and now it turns out that there's a whole family of dendritic cells and they have different functions, activating and suppressing. And that's a talk for another day. But they communicate with the musicians of the immune orchestra, the T cells, the B cells, and then, as I mentioned, the macrophages and the NK cells as well. These are human dendritic cells de derived from blood monocytes. And you can see here the processes, the delicate tree-like processes. Um, this is actually the, the Founders Hall at the Rockefeller it was the original institute building. In my office, you can't really see it, but it's right up there. So dendritic cells are key in orchestrating immunity. So they're actually key in establishing any vaccine response. And that was the case even before anybody knew about them. So vaccines are the probably bit most successful and most important public health intervention other than clean water. And I love this slide, and it's particularly appropriate to show it here, not too far from the CDC, because you don't see something that doesn't happen. So if an epidemic doesn't occur, if we do something to avert it, we don't really know about it. And one of the problems with getting people to, to uh, appreciate the importance of vaccines is when people don't get sick, you kind of don't notice. So th these are statistics on the number of cases of a variety of potentially lethal infectious diseases in a year before there was a vaccine, and the years vary from 1900 here for smallpox, till after, and you can see the years here. Um, obviously, you can see we're not so good about vaccinating for pertussis, and it's not that the vaccine isn't good, but that's a vaccine that has faced a certain amount of political um, opposition, and so those cases are due to people who have um, decided not to vaccinate their children. Um, and this is a wonderful paper that looked at vaccination programs. It was in the New England Journal in 2013, um, led by Don Burke, who was actually, I don't know, Pat, when you came with us, was he still leading the program? I think he might have been. Debbie had just taken over. But he led the program. He was the person who hired me at the rare, and he's now the dean of the public, school of public health there. But he looked at... Um, the number of diseases that have actually been prevented by licensed vaccines. And it's a wonderful paper for those of you who are interested in that sort of thing. The principle of a vaccine is what does not kill you makes you stronger. So the idea is to fool the body into thinking that it has seen the pathogen before. So remember I mentioned earlier that if you got measles, if you got natural infection from measles, you would get sick, you'd get better, and you would have memory in the form of long-lasting memory T cells that would be there if you were going to encounter, that, that would be there if you would encounter measles again. So the idea of any of these vaccines is to induce that same sort of memory. The first person to do this did it a very long time ago. This is Edward Jenner. He was an English country physician who lived between 1749 and 1823. So if you think about when he worked, not only did nobody know about dendritic cells, there were no, the, the idea of viruses or even bacteria was over a century away. Harvey's notion of circulation of the blood was novel technology for this man. So you know, it's just hard to imagine a worldview so different from our own. But he was a good doctor, 
and he made observations in his um, practice. And he noticed that the milkmaids, so smallpox was, was a, a terrible epidemic scourge. And smallpox, even though it's, it's horrible, it's 30, it has a 30% mortality rate. So that means in a village where smallpox would come through, 70% of the people who would get it would recover. Now, 30% mortality rate is pretty horrible. In the worst months of October of the 1918 flu epidemic, the pandemic where you know, the cities were paralyzed, the mortality in the city of Philadelphia was 10%. And that paralyzed the city. You know, uh, Stephen King's novels about uh, the stand, when 10% of people are dying of a disease, the world is coming to an end. So, so smallpox is a, is a dreadful scourge, but still that means 70% of people who get it get better. But they would be left with pockmarked skin. So Jenner noticed that the milkmaids were known for their smooth skin. We also noticed that they had a lesion, or many of them had lesions on their hands that came from milking the cows. And he hypothesized that somehow those lesions were protecting them. And he took the material from those lesions and using ivory points, so there are no needles, at this, hypodermic needles at this point. I don't know if this is working or I'm doing this wrong. There we go. Taking these ivory points, he scratched it into the skin, first of orphan children and then his own family. So I'm vice chair of our IRB, and this would never pass the <laughs> IRB these days. But it, it, it established the principle of vaccination for the first time. And vaca is the Latin word for cow, so vaccination actually refers specifically to the use of cowpox to prevent smallpox. So it's kind of like Xerox or Kleenex, though I don't believe it was ever trademarked. So that vaccine, again, those same, those same older people like me here who um, lived through measles, we were all smallpox vaccinated. Smallpox is the first and the only disease to be eradicated by the use of vaccination. And it was eradicated, uh, you know, the year that I think the WHO announced it was in 1972. I think that's right. Um, and we no longer vaccinate for it because it doesn't exist except in some freezers, and we hope that it's going to stay there. So another, so that's active vaccination. And there is another kind of, the term vaccination is sometimes used for the use of passive antibody protection or passive immunization. It really isn't immunization. Rather, it's the administration of antibodies, remember, made by the B cells that can be given from, transferred from one person to another to protect somebody who is not immune themselves. And it, this, was, um, this was developed in 1890 to 1892 for diphtheria and tetanus toxins. And you can see here that before the diphtheria vaccination, this was the, um, this was the the, really the only effective therapy for diphtheria, and it still is, in fact, I guess. There's really no, well, now there's antibiosis, but before antibiosis. So the Rockefeller, as I said, was founded in 1901, and the first 20 years of the Institute were de really largely devoted to the development of the use of passive antibody administration for the product protection from pneumococcal disease. Before antibiotics, 20% of deaths in New York City were due to pneumococcal disease, these antibodies were raised in horses, and so the first time you got the antibody, you were good. The second time you got the antibody, a lot of people got sick.